Today we're going to start talking about junction field effect transistors or JFETs. These devices are distinct from bipolar junction transistors. They have some advantages and some disadvantages. Quick list. Item number one, they tend to be fast devices, good high frequency devices. They tend to have low noise, also low distortion. And some configurations, they have a very, very high input impedance at low frequencies in DC. On the downside, they don't tend to have as much voltage gain potential as bipolars. So let's not think of them as uh, replacements for bipolars, but they're just a different sort of device. Right? It has its own pluses and minuses. So before we actually get into the theory of this, let's take care of a little practical end, and that is a schematic symbol. So we'll start off with our tried and true friend here which is the NPN bipolar, right? So we know we have uh, collector, emitter, base terminals. Now the analogous terminals and symbol for the FET would look like this. Again, the arrow always points in the direction of N material. Just as this is an NPN transistor, this is what's referred to as an N-channel JFET. This line right here is the channel, so to speak. And the three terminals that we have are the gate, which is roughly analogous to the base, the drain, which is analogous to the collector, and the source, which is analogous to the emitter. All right. So how are these things actually built? What's the insides of them, so to speak? Well, we would start with a nice piece of silicon. Now, on the bottom end here, we would have this substrate. This is what it's built on, right? A P substrate. And embedded in here, we would have P material for the gate. Now, the leads would go like so. Uh, here we have the drain terminal. This is the source terminal and this is our gate terminal. This area right in here would be N material. This is the channel. Right? This big area right in here is the channel. All right, now we're gonna connect up a couple of components to this. I'm gonna put a little current limiting resistor over here on the drain, the drain power supply. This will be our ground connection. We're going to run the source right to ground, and then we're also going to put a resistor in the gate and a gate power supply. Now, the interesting thing about the gate power supply is that this is going to be sort of upside down. It's a negative power supply. We're going to put a negative voltage on to the gate. All right? So we got VDD back here and VGG back here. All right, now under normal conditions with um, no applied potentials, just sitting here sort of in a room, what we would find is that there would be, from thermal effects, there would be a small depletion region that would develop, right? We would have holes and electrons that would sort of jump across here. Right, electrons filling holes, so we have a little bit of a depletion region. Now, when we apply a potential over here, we're going to start this potential at zero and bring it up and see what happens. Along the way, we're going to be changing values for VGG. Initially, we're going to start with a gate voltage of zero, and I'm going to plot what this looks like, oops, let's try a darker pen. We'll plot what this looks like over on this side. So over here, this is going to be uh, the drain source voltage, right? The voltage from here to here. And going up is going to be the drain current, right? The current that's flowing 
through this device. All right. Um, I'm going to draw this using electron flow. I think it makes a little bit more sense. So just to distinguish this from the normal, um, the way we would typically draw this, you know, with conventional flow, I'm going to use dashed lines. So it's going to flow from ground up to the plus, right, as, a, as an electron flow, sort of the, the logical inversion of conventional flow. All right. Initially, when we have zero volts, zero volts, obviously we're going to be sitting back here at the origin. Again, I'm going to keep the gate voltage source at zero, and I'm going to start to turn up VDD and see what happens. Well, initially what we have in this channel is sort of an ohmic effect. In other words, it's doped to a certain level, and when we turn this power supply on, this current is going to become flowing in like so. All right, comes back to the power supply. Um, the amount of that current will depend on, quite literally, the physical characteristics of this channel. So it kind of behaves like um, a resistor. Now, notice that there's going to be a voltage gradient across this. If this is, think of it as a resistor, uh, there will be a voltage developed across it. The more resistance there is, the bigger the voltage. So over here, we know this is ground. We know this is zero. And over here, we're going to have some positive value. Well, what does that do to this depletion region? You know, on this side of it, essentially, this is going to get bigger. We have a bigger reverse bias. Initially, we just had the thermal effects. But now we have a reverse bias diode, right? Because this point is ground and this point is positive. All right, so my N material is more positive than my P material. So this is going to grow, and it grows sort of asymmetrically. We're going to get something that kind of goes more like this. All right. And what this is doing is it's starting to squeeze off the channel here. And that starts to um, change the resistance, as we'll see. But basically, the, the, the current is going um, up, but it's following a trajectory that's more like a resistor. It's going to go like this. Okay. Basically, the slope on this is uh, just going to give us a resistance value, right? We can call that a channel resistance, if you will. Now, as we turn this up, turn this up, turn this up, this depletion region just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, it gets to the point where it pretty much squeezes off, pinches off, if you will, this channel. And what happens then is the current plateaus, flattens out, and we've hit a maximum current. This voltage right here, we refer to that as the pinch-off voltage, VP. We sort of pinched off the channel, if you will. We squeeze it down. It's kind of like taking like a hose and putting a kink in it. You know, you can only get so much water through there, or like a valve. Right, a water valve. You're squeezing this thing down, and that's all we can get. Now, that particular current, this plateau value, is referred to on a spec sheet as IDSS. Right, this is the drain current that you're going to get with a shorted source, meaning zero volts for the gate source. Now, as we turn up this voltage even higher, this just kind of keeps on going until eventually, big surprise, we hit breakdown, just like we do in a bipolar, and the current goes through the roof. And so that point is referred to typically as BV DGS, right? That's the breakdown voltage that we see on the uh, drain source, okay? Again, we've got a shorted uh, gate source. Okay, now what happens when we start throwing in different values for the gate voltage? Well, if we were to, let's say, start with um, going from zero maybe to like minus 0.5 or minus one volts, what ends up happening is instead of sort of starting with the yellow, it's kind of like we're starting with the orange, right? Because we already have a bias on this thing. So essentially what happens is the initial amount of, of current that we get, the current voltage characteristic, is a little bit slower. In other words, it's 
not going to be quite as steep. And it's going to hit this pinch-off point sooner before it actually flattens out. All right. So this curve on the top, this would be for you know VGS equals zero volts. And then this would be for, like I said, maybe minus 0.5 or minus 1 or something like that. This slope is not as steep as this slope. And this corner is a little bit further back toward the axis, a little bit back further towards zero. And we keep doing this, right? Let's go make this a little bit more negative. Well, now instead of starting at the, you know, the orange, it's starting at somewhere, you know, like in between here. Okay? And again, it's sort of like starting early. You're putting a bias on it. And this, this PN junction is already starting with this uh, reverse bias. So same thing, right? Comes up, flattens out, eventually hits breakdown. So if you zoom in on this, what you're getting are these different slopes, right? You got uh, VGS is zero, VGS is minus one, VGS is minus two, so on and so forth. The exact shape of this will depend on the you know, physical layout of the FET, but this is what we're looking at. Now, if we go negative enough, then this right off the bat will have sort of taken that hose and completely kinked it or cranked off the, uh, the, the water valve, in which case we will get nothing, right? This will just come out and that'll be the end of that. Maybe a little tiny leakage current, but that's it. When we hit that point, we call that VGS off. We get no current flow. All right? So we could make a little graph of this, what's going on over here. Notice, by the way, this is a second quadrant device. You know, a, a bipolar transistor is a first quadrant device. If you plot the um, control voltage, VBE, versus the output current, right, IC, that's in the first quadrant. They're both positive. Over here, this is second quadrant. So here's our drain current, ID. Now, first quadrant's out here. We have a positive VGS which we're never going to do. We have to have this thing reverse biased for this to work. As soon as it goes forward bias, forget about it. We lose all control over uh, the, the uh, channel conduction there. So we have to have a negative VGS. And our curve, if we were to plot what's happening with VGS and the resulting ID, we would get a curve that does something like this. So down here, is VGS off. And right here is our IDSS. Now this is not a straight line. This is in fact part of a parabola. It's a square law uh, relationship. Before I go any further, VGS off, the magnitude of this happens to equal VP. So we can say that uh, VP is the absolute value of VGS off. Right? They are related. It's worth knowing. So what is the equation of this particular curve? Well, it turns out that the equation for that curve, ID, in other words, some value of ID, is going to equal this maximum value, IDSS, times the quantity, 1 minus VGS, the gate source voltage of interest, divided by the endpoint, the VGS off, that quantity squared, right? So square law, as we say. So uh, if we had a circuit, we knew what the um, VGS was, right? If I had a bias circuit and I know what gate source voltage is, I could sort of plot this if I had a curve, come up here and, you know, this would tell me what ID is. In this case, we just use the equation. Um, I can measure the values of IDSS and uh, VGS off fairly quickly. We'll get into that in just a, mo a moment um, in lab. And then you could just, like I said, use this formula and off you go. All right. Now, extending this, it turns out that there is a characteristic that's very useful for us, which would be the slope of this line. And that's called the transconductance GM. So the slope of this line is basically the, the change in ID versus the change in VGS, right? It's current over voltage, so it's a, it's a conductance, 
we call it a transconductance. You know, trans is across, right? So it's across the device, so to speak, from input to output. So this is called transconductance GM. So the uh, slope of this, we would take the derivative of this. So our constants here are IDSS and VGS off. So we would get two times IDSS divided by the uh, negative VGS off. Right, and then that will be uh, multiplied by the element in the parentheses. And of course, the square term disappears, right? So that's what we have. Now, if we were to plug VGS value of zero in here, right, this piece disappears, and all we're left with is this part of it. Well, if VGS is zero, then by definition, the current you're getting is IDSS. So this is the highest current. It's also the steepest part of the curve. In other words, the GM, when VGS is zero, is the biggest possible transconductance you get. Um, we refer to that as GM zero. And by definition, that would have to equal just this piece. In other words, a negative two IDSS over VGS off. Which means we could rewrite this equation and say, well, gm equals gm0 times 1 minus vgs over vgs off. Okay? All right, now, the next thing we would notice is that this term you know, appears twice. So if gm over gm0 is equal to 1 minus vgs over vgs off, in other words, I could plug that into here, right? We could then say that ID over IDSS would have to equal GM divided by GM0, quantity squared. As we need to find GM, right, we could just take the square root on this, and we would find ultimately that GM do that like that. Oh, that looks like a J. Don't want that. Uh, GM would equal the uh, maximum value, GM0, times the square root of ID over IDSS. Cool. So that's a useful formula. That's a useful formula. That's a useful formula, right? So we've got a bunch of things we're going to use here for um, biasing as well as uh, AC amplifier analysis. Okay, uh, what about a model for this thing, right? We're going to need a, a, a biasing model and an AC model for it. Well, look at it this way. We've got a, a voltage on the input end that's controlling a current on the output end. So this is a voltage-controlled current source. Right? It's a voltage-controlled current source. So it's different from a bipolar, right? And the bipolar is a current-controlled current source. The input current, base current, is what controls the output current, the collector emitter current, all right? So this is voltage controlled, a little bit different, but it's still a current source, right? It's still a current source. So the model would look something like this. We have a controlled current source. So here's my current source. Uh, if you want, you can draw that as a little diamond, your choice. There is a resistor coming in off here. Here is the source. Here is the gate. Here is the drain. Now, the value of this current, ID, is GM times the value of the gate source voltage. And this works for both AC and DC. Right? So in AC, obviously, we're going to use a script I and a script VGS. Um, but this is what we, we have for the value of the current source. Now, the value of the uh, resistance, right, RGS, this is essentially the resistance we see looking into this reversed bias PN junction. Well, the resistance of a reverse bias PN junction ideally is infinity. All right. So this is where we're going to see this, this circuit having uh, very high input impedance. Right? That's going to work out uh, much to our favor in certain applications. OK, last thing before we, we break here. Um, how do I measure these parameters like IDSS and uh, VGS off in a lab? Uh, 
you know, uh, if you want to find the beta for a bipolar, you could hook up a little circuit, get a couple of ammeters to measure the base current and the collector current, and, you know, take the ratio, and that's your beta. Um, turns out it's actually pretty easy to, to measure these parameters uh, with reasonable accuracy. Um, IDSS is the maximum current. You know, this is kind of different from the bipolar where we don't really have a, a maximum current until we actually run into, you know, thermal issues with the transistor, right? That's sort of an upper limit based on destroying the device. Here it's just sort of a built-in, right? You can't, you can't go be, uh, uh, beyond IDSS. So, um, you know, that's not a thermal thing, right? This device could be running at 90% of IDSS and it really wouldn't, uh, you know, necessarily burn up. Um, so all we have to do is take a transistor, take our, our JFET. I want to make the gate source voltage be zero. So I'll run the gate to ground, run the source to ground, so VGS has to be zero. And then I just have to make sure that the voltage that's applied is bigger than VP, is bigger than the pinch-off voltage. I'll just put an ammeter in here and then run this up to some power supply, right? And I'll just make sure that this power supply is greater than the pinch-off. In other words, greater than the absolute value of VGS off we expect. For most FETs, if you got up to 10, 12, 15 volts, that would be sufficient. So you turn the power on, right? This is positive, just to be sure. Um, you turn the power on, you measure the current, bingo, there's your IDSS. It's that simple. Now, to get the VGS off, that's a little trickier because this really flattens out. I mean, it is a part of a parabola, as I said. Um, so it's a little bit trickier, but all we really have to do is make a little modification here. We'll put in a negative power supply, and we'll simply make this adjustable. And we just make this voltage more and more and more negative until finally this current goes to zero. Practically speaking, you would like this to be notably less than, let's say, 1% of whatever you just measured for IDSS, right? So if I just measured my IDSS, you know, initially, and it was 10 milliamps, um, I'm going to turn this down until this, this drain current is, uh, you know, like 10 microamps or something like that. And that'll give me a very good, uh, a very good value over here. Now, one final thing before we take off, this equation, and it's associated equation for the transconductance coming down here does have a built-in assumption and that is these equations work only when your VGS is less than zero volts. Well technically you could say less than or equal to zero volts and it's got to be greater than or equal to VGS off. It's got to be between here and here, basically. I mean, this equation describes a curve that you know goes out into the first quadrant and you know, reflects back out there. Um, so you could put crazy values in there, and the equation will give you an answer, but that's not really what the device is doing, right? The device is only valid within that range, All right? Okay, so next time we are going to look at some ways of biasing this device. There's different ways of doing that, just like there are with our bipolars. Um, Approaches are a little bit different, but we are going to make use of these equations. We're going to make use of you know these kinds of curves and other curves, and then uh, we'll work our way into some AC uh, amplification applications as well.